Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. I am joined by Eric Relf of Comstock Investments. And we are going to take a look at the market reaction after the WASDE report came out Thursday morning, of course. As we all know, it came out at noon Eastern time, 11 o'clock Central time. And uh, Eric and I will run through the numbers here momentarily. In the meantime, make sure you like this video, share this video with others, and subscribe to it. How do you do that? Well, you hit that little bell icon down below, and we'll let you know when new episodes are posted. Eric, USDA uh, didn't disappoint once again. They came out with some numbers that caused a lot of questions after the report came out. So let's walk through these one by one, and we have some graphics to go together with this. Um, what do you want to look at first? Do you, do you want to take a look at the, uh, uh, the stockpiles or, or production? What do you think? I think that I'll take a look at these with the, with the audience as I did when the numbers came out. So okay. I'm going to start with the uh, world crop production numbers. Uh, okay. There was There was anticipation that we might see the USDA get a little closer to the ever dropping CONAB number and they proved they were not willing to budge again. So when we look at those uh, world crop production numbers, Brazil soybean production at 155, that's where they were last month. That is now uh, nine and a half million tons above CONAB. Um, the CONAB released their new numbers and uh, I'm sorry, eight and a half. And they, they are still way down there and they continue to just slightly trim every time they come out with a new set and the USDA won't come around. Corn at 124, that was higher than the average estimate. There's still a lot to go on with the Safrina crop in Brazil, so not too big of a, a surprise there. Uh, I think maybe the bigger surprise was that anyone expected them to change the number. But we come in line with last month at 124. That's likely not going to move until at least next month uh, when we start to see what that looks like as we further into the growing season. Argentina, uh, basically in line with where we thought they would be, although still not in line with where the Buenos Aires Grain Exchange is on the corn number. Uh, this is about where we thought the USDA would be. We did see a slight trim there. They're willing to recognize that maybe things aren't going as well as they had been. Argentina just had a great growing season up until recently, and now we're seeing them go backwards a little bit. So that'll be one worth watching for sure. But when you combine the Conab corn trim that we saw this morning, along with that Argentina corn trim, you're talking six, six and a half million metric tons. That starts to make a difference. So we'll see how that plays out. Well, the big question everybody had uh, immediately, it just jumped right off the page when USDA said 155 for the million metric ton production out of Brazil on soybeans. Yep. You commented before we started recording this episode here that uh, they have just kind of held tight. And this is kind of similar to the tactic that they used last year. Right. Yeah. We never did see the USDA align with the CONAB number last year. And actually after, well, after months after the growing season, uh, CONAB actually started revising their numbers higher for the prior crop year. And the USDA did the same. And at the end of it all, um, the USDA wasn't far off from the end of their growing season to when those revisions were completed months later. So I think they're kind of sticking to their guns and saying, prove it to us. And, and then maybe we'll see some number revision that that's meaningful. But for now, they're they're going to wait and see, I think. Do you recall, were they this far apart last year, though? No. No, they weren't. They weren't this far apart. Uh, I want to say it was uh, closer to 4 million metric tons, so less than half of this of this gap so i mean you're talking tens and tens of millions of bushels that they are oh. apart and that's just over and above what the brazilian own estimate would be i mean we're not talking total production i mean that's a that's a long ways apart here yeah you, you're you, this the disparagement between the usta and conab right now is equal to our carry our, our so what, how do we how do we handle this i mean the planters are starting to roll in the midwest yeah and does this take the upside out of the market now? I mean, what do you think here? Well, I don't think it takes it away, but it certainly takes it to a point where people are having a hard time hanging on because of cash flow needs to where we might see the, the impetus for a real rally. I don't know where that'll come or what will be the trigger when we see these numbers revised. Of course, nobody knows that stuff, but whatever potentials for rallies exist, the first one we have coming in the next month, if we don't catch that one and that being from uncooperative planting weather uh if if that doesn't provide us a decent rally 
and we don't see the next one until the heart of summer. And in between there, we should see some alignment of numbers out of Brazil because they will be completed with their harvest and they will be working on their export program in earnest. So uh, there's, there's a lot of variables here. Don't know what the timing will be, but this is this is pretty ridiculous, honestly. Okay. Now, uh, what about the other numbers that came out? Uh, let's walk through some of those too. Let's yeah. talk about uh, uh, U.S. ending stocks. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about those numbers? Yeah, that was that was the second key point. That's where I went to after the Brazil numbers mostly. Um, and and really, I, I guess the the only surprise to me was that the the soybean number was a little higher, not not bad enough to where I was uh, awestruck by it by any stretch of the imagination. But you know, our export program hasn't been keeping pace. Um, USDA has surprisingly uh, lowered our domestic crush needs um and and so that demand has been lowered on several of their reports and and so there there's just some things that have to play out here domestically but we know the exports aren't there so we expected to see a little higher uh u.s ending stocks number for the soybeans we saw that corn was right in line with expectation although a little lower than last month so that was a good thing and we we had talked about that yesterday and we'd hoped we see some kind of reflection there it wasn't what we'd hoped for but it was something uh, due to additional ethanol grind and export demand. So the usage numbers that that seemed to catch a few people off guard there. And uh, how do you think USDA is looking at, for example, feed usage here in the U.S.? Do you think that makes sense? Well, I, I think that it's a bit of a struggle for me to look at the flock reductions, herd reductions, all these livestock. Um, number struggles that we're having that have been propping up some of these markets and and you know especially in the case of the cattle i mean kill cow market is still hot we're looking at a, a negligible spread between select and choice cuts meaning they're still starving for hamburger bull and cow kill are still very elevated uh so you're killing the factories you know and we continue to reduce this herd size and then just to make things worse and and I'm I'm glad we had the segue to talk about this. The USDA decides to cancel the July cattle inventory report as part of their last round of budget cuts. And I would I really thought that report was going to be the the jumping off place for the next rally. Uh, I thought that was going to be reflective of just how bad things have gotten, and now we don't get to see those numbers. I'd rather do away with the cattle on feed every other month and keep those inventory reports or something, but. This is what we have to deal with now. And so, I, I I mean, I think we should probably have more commercial feeding going on. We've had struggles with grass. We've had struggles with pasture and forage that have, I, I guess, you know, multi-year. We're, we're still not recognizing the fact that there's nowhere else to feed these animals to put on any real pounds when you talk about the cattle. And maybe that's being offset by some of the, some of the birds that they're having to kill by the thousands uh due to different diseases and things particularly this most recent round of avian flu what do you think about the overall budget that usda has to work with and all the things that they have expenditures on this is what they choose to right. cut to right. try and make ends meet i mean it kind of defies logic doesn't it this is a oh, pretty absolutely. critical piece of information absolutely yeah this and and only being a a, a biannual report anyway you know we only get one in january and july this this is not one that we needed or could afford in the industry to to take out however if they think they're going to save a few bucks they're certainly going to upset the least number of people by eliminating these kind of reports than eliminating you know food benefits to welfare recipients or you know where most of their money is allocated that would have people up in arms a little bit more where the cattle industry represents like half of 0.1% of the population. You know, I mean, they, they know they're going to ruffle feathers, just not very many of them this way. Well, let's take a look at how the uh, the cattle market closed on Thursday. They did come back somewhat. They did, yeah. It took back uh, over half of yesterday's losses in many cases, especially in the live cattle. Um, we, we hit some really good technical support. There were several key contracts in both live and feeder cattle that over the last few days have got right down to 62% retracement levels. These are big uh, technical trader marks that we're being watched for. Some will refer to the 62% as a full retracement, although it kind of doesn't make sense because it's only 62%, but you'll still hear that kind of talk amongst technicians. And so um, that that was big, and we saw a big bounce off of those 
levels, especially in the key contracts when you look at the heaviest volume. So that, yeah, definitely impressive today. Now, it's going to be up to headlines. Would that be negated tomorrow then if they turn around and actually take those support levels out then? Would that just pretty much uh, put us back on a downtrend and uh, we don't know where the bottom would be? Correct. Yeah. Then we'd be looking at those December lows. Um, I don't have the charts in front of me, but yeah, that, that would be the case. So do we get headlines, uh, more avian flu problems? Uh, do they pin it to any beef cattle? You know, these are the things that we're watching for now. And, and I've made the comment, I don't know how many times over the last two weeks, there have been no cases in beef cattle. It's all been in dairy. And if we get that, then we may have a bigger problem on our hands. We'd take out those 62% retracements like they weren't even there. And then we'd be targeting those December lows. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope we get a sizable rally here that gives folks an opportunity to hedge that have missed the boat over the last couple of months. So the report of a human case, a human fatality in the United Kingdom from H5N1, uh, that story must have turned out to be a nothing burger. Yeah, I mean, it, it just didn't get the circulation, luckily, because it was a one-off event. And who knows what kind of uh, condition that individual was in prior. And, and you know, we, we, don't, we just don't know enough details. All we know is that from, from the time they reported him symptomatic to seeking treatment uh, to dead was a very brief window. But if any... You know, anybody who's ever gone to the doctor knows they don't just wake up, have a little stuffy nose and go straight to the doctor. You know, who knows what could have happened in the days preceding that. And so I'm trying not to play the guessing game or sensationalize it too much, but uh, you get many more reports like that and you've got an issue. Okay. So you talked about how the cattle market uh, looked like maybe it did find support at the 62% retracement <laughs> level. Hogs, on the other hand, I mean, they were just rocketing higher, but now it looks like they're taking a breather. Is that a healthy thing or does it look toppy to you? Uh, both. Uh, it needs a correction. It needs a healthy correction, but it does look like we've, we've likely seen, unless we see some surprising news or something, but we've likely seen a seasonal high here. The summer month hogs in particular just got way ahead of cash. And even though the cash is impressive, it's not likely to be sustained long term unless we start to do something about numbers. And the pigs that are coming on would, would negate that thought process. And so I, I was taking advantage of some July hogs in the 110 area. I thought that was a pretty attractive area to get some feeders to start hedging a little bit. And we got some of that done yesterday and I'm glad we did. Uh, not to say that this thing is done just yet, but it does look a, a it's it's in pretty thin air. Okay, now at this point, now that the WASD is behind us, it looks like about the only thing we have to look forward to is active planting weather in the plains in the Midwest. And from what I understand, it looks like the green flag is going to be out. For the most part, I would say that's right. They're still wet from the Ohio Valley down through the Delta. Uh, you, you've got forecasted storms moving across areas of the northern plains and northwest Corn Belt following a really nice day on monday however if we can stay dry which i'm sitting in northwest iowa and it's spitting rain all day today so nobody's rolling today if we can stay dry from today till till saturday this weekend it's going to be going and blowing and they're going to have saturdays if if we stay dry till saturday they're going to have saturday sunday monday and then it looks like it gets a little sketchy after that so we'll see but they can plan a lot in three days now all right so if that's the case would that help local bases do you think because it might shut down some immediate deliveries for a while. That's right. And you're, and you're already starting to see that reflected. Uh, I, I feel that a call asking that exact question earlier today. And I said, absolutely. This is, this is a result of trying to get grain at a time when they know you're busy. So they're trying to entice you away from the tractor and get you in the truck. And, and we're going to see some of that. So even though you have a, a kind of a weak futures market right now, Maybe that alone would be a little bit of an opportunity, maybe gain a few cents out there just if you pay attention. Sure. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff's going to be going on. We have geographic problems with the corn, big time. Uh, there are places right now that are bidding up to a dollar and a quarter over on old crop and, and already a dollar over on new crop, that being in the cattle feeding regions of the Western Plains. But for people here, you know, the basis had been deteriorating. Now they're seeing a little bump here. This is going to be a bigger story as we get through the growing season before this crop comes out of the ground, because uh, this is year 88 of Dr. Owen Taylor's 89 year drought cycle. So it could be kind of interesting.
Um, I know you and I had been talking yesterday about the wheat, and the wheat market seemed to surge on Wednesday from talk of kind of hot, dry, windy conditions in the plains. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it looks to me like they took a lot of that back here on Thursday. Did they change the forecast or what was with that? A, a little bit of that, yeah. The northern plains, particularly spring wheat country and the northern HRW country, uh, they're, they're set to get some pretty good rains out of this situation. We get a new conditions rating on Monday. We're already twice as, the, the good to excellent category is twice as large as it was this time last year with rains in the forecast. So, and, you know, the numbers today were a little revealing too. You look at uh, on the on the wheat stocks, that number just keeps trickling higher because we're not keeping pace uh, on the on the export side of things. Because Russia and, and Europe, e, the EU and Russia are taking a lot of that business. So Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. When you look at the, uh, the world ending stocks or the world <laughs> uh, stocks report that came out on Thursday, yeah. uh, was that something in particular that caught your attention, the wheat component of that? It, it was a bit surprising to me to see lower than last month um, on the on the world ending stocks for wheat, uh, not much, but a little bit lower. So, but to see it at all lower was a little bit surprising because we had heard about how Russia had finally started bolstering their prices a little bit. Their FOB had gone up after they had dropped it fifteen percent in a month. Then they started working it higher again. Paris milling wheat has been moving higher of late, and so I thought. You know, maybe we had negated some of that, but I guess as I'm saying that, I, I have to think most of this uh, most of this information is all documented by the end of March anyway. So really, these rallies we've seen have been since then. So it'll be interesting to see how the forecasts pan out on in the next week or so uh, out in the plains and see yeah. if the crop can hang in there or not. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Good to talk with you again. That's Eric Ralph. He's with Comptock Investments with us here on today's episode. Thank you for joining us. Well, for producer Brian Hendrickson, I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time on the Comstock Channel. Thanks for joining us on our Comstock YouTube channel. Don't forget, you can also find us on Facebook and TikTok as well. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.